Um, so that, and you may have noticed I'm, I'm playing music at the beginning of class, like starting before class starts and kind of running into class, basically. That's partly because with the 50 minute for music format or 50 minute format for class, I don't have a lot of time to play examples and have discussion and analysis. I need to kind of just lob examples at you guys to check out. Um, but here's an example of a hip hop group that's actually using Max as their production, as part of their production workflow, okay? Um, Real quick, I'm a little behind on the recordings. I just got last Friday's recording posted this morning. I, I edited, finished editing it last night, and I posted it this morning. Um, so you can check that out if you're if you missed that class and you need to make it up. Uh, feel free to do that. If uh, you missed Monday, that should be coming soon. Um, so look for that uh, shortly here as I get kind of caught up on things. Uh, I do know that with the hurricane, there's supposed to be an announcement sometime this morning about what the status is of classes on Thursday and Friday, um, or Thursday or Friday, because they, they might cancel one day and not the other. Friday is the more likely of the two. Uh, but know that until you hear official word, classes are not canceled as of right now. So make sure you uh, are watching the, the various Stetson announcement outlets. Yeah, Chad. Uh-huh. Yeah. We usually try to. I don't know. It depends on the, the schedule, basically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So be aware that you should be watching the, the kind of the, the official Stetson news uh, outlets uh, this morning because there should be some sort of announcement about the status of classes and the status of campus because this the track is coming our way basically so watch out for that um, but, uh, so that you are, are aware of how this kind of intersects with our timeline okay, let's uh, let's have one conversation here guys uh, you need to notify me today if you're doing a cover song uh, if there is some sort of issue with classes, I will have to be flexible with that required draft that's due on Friday, okay? Um, so just watch the new, I'll, I'll try to follow up with a, another email message to you guys about what to do uh, for uh, for the, the draft that's due on Friday as well. If if Because if the campus is evacuated, obviously I can't have you here working on things to, to make, meet my deadline, right? Um, okay. Uh, everything should be returned back to normal by Monday, and we'll still do workshops in class on Monday. Um, but just like I said, be be aware of that. Be um, and be aware of this deadline today. I've I've heard from a few of you about doing cover songs, and that those are fine. We kind of talked through those. But if you are intending to do a cover song, you need to let me know today. Okay. Um, Reading response. Honestly, I got a little sidetracked this morning, so I got I didn't get a chance to look at the reading responses. Uh, how are these tutorials? Are they better, worse, same as the Max, the ones we've done in Max before? Okay, I'm seeing some head nods. Yes. A little, a little less on this one. I thought. A little less on this. A little less helpful. Less helpful. Less helpful. Okay. And they kind of they started in sampling and then veered into wavetable synthesis, which is related, but not exactly the same. Uh, I'm going to focus more on sampling today. Uh, and as I mentioned on Monday, I'm going to kind of finish up what we started on Monday and then transition into Max and show you some of the same techniques in Max, how we might pull in samples, how we might play them back, how we might manipulate pitch and those types of things with samples in Max. Um, Wavetable synthesis, uh, like I said, it's, it's important to know because it's... Um, it's it's related, but it's a it's a related but different use of how to use samples. Okay, um, and in some ways we've been using wavetable synthesis. Part of how you generate these different waveforms that we these basic waveforms is by using a wavetable. Um, that's one technique for it. So uh, it's just that with wavetable synthesis you use a more specialized uh, wavetable for drawing different timbres, different shapes in your uh, your oscillator, so to speak. But let's get started with Ableton Live. We looked last time at the launch and follow commands. Um, I, I had to really breeze through that, but hopefully you saw that there's really some power there of actually creating interactively um, self-randomizing, self-organizing tracks inside of Live that you 
can't do in any other DAW that I know of. Uh, we looked at enveloping and be able to draw in envelopes of control data such as pitch bend. Um, you can do the same thing with your uh, parameters on both the instruments and the effects op objects. Okay, um, I started we pulled over a track for Impulse, and in the set that I've got for today, I've already got the sound files loaded into Impulse. Um, I've also got a sound file loaded into the simpler uh, instrument, and we'll take a look at that. Okay, so if you don't already have it, make sure you've got the... I'm going to go ahead and launch live. Again, this is on Blackboard uh, for today at the top of the examples folder. Is that examples folder still useful, uh, even though it's like getting really long to scroll to the bottom? I just put the most recent one at the top. Does anybody have to go back there uh, at a later time and try to find stuff, or you basically just use it in class and then you're out of sight, out of mind? Okay. I'm just wondering, because scrolling through that long list sometimes for me, it takes some time. Uh, okay, so we're at this start of class here, okay? Um, so you should more or less recognize this kind of beat from Monday. Okay, and I've left the follow instructions in place so that it uh, randomizes. Now, I'm playing just my regular sound files, but uh, what I want to highlight uh, here at the start of class is that you can actually, um, once you've got your sound files in there, you've got a, a quite a bit of control in how to I'll move it up to the top of the screen there. Okay, you've got quite a bit of control over each sound file. Okay, so when you're in the impulse object. You can switch between the layers, switch between the different sound files here just by clicking these tabs. But then on each one of these you've got controls. The first one is has to do with where it starts in the sound file as well as transposition of the sound file. And then what, what they call stretch is how quickly or slowly you want to play the sound file. So at 0% it's going to play at normal speed. If you stretch it up let me see, uh, it would probably be good to do something that is just that layer. Right here what that's doing. That's because I've moved the stretch up 90%, so it's now trying to play it at half the speed, basically. And so you get this kind of what that's doing. Okay. So at really extreme extreme settings, that stretch can do some interesting sound designy type things because you're you're taking that sound file and stretching it, okay? You can go the other direction to compress it so that it goes faster as well, okay? Um, so then in addition to that, you also have transposition. So if I play that, let's I can raise the pitch, that's the same sound file. I can lower the pitch, which for a, a kick drum is useful, yes? To lower it. I can get really, really low with the pitch, okay? So you've got pitch control here. You also have start control, which tells live to effectively jump into the sound file a little bit. So not start right at the beginning of the sound file, but to like skip over the first 15, 20 seconds, or 15, 20 milliseconds. Why would we want to skip over parts of the sound file? The yeah, the attack, right? The, the attack tends to be the noisiest part of, of sounds, okay? And so if you don't, if you want to get to more of the, the, the pitchier part of the sound, the, the tonal part of the sound, sometimes skipping over the first 25 milliseconds can help you uh, eliminate some of the noise that's at the beginning of your sound file, okay? Um, just the way that, particularly percussion sounds are, um, but even some 
uh, brass instruments, some uh, string instruments. The, the attack portion is usually a little noisier, uh, and so it can change the quality. And there's been some uh, psychoacoustic research that shows that uh, the when you chop off the beginnings of sound, it actually changes our perception of what instrument it is. Actually, people get more confused between instruments when you chop off the beginnings of the sounds. Uh, okay, so you can kind of, again, mess with the perception of what instrument this is by chopping off the beginning, okay? Um, the other interesting bit is that uh, I, I always like things that say random because it adds variation into things, okay? So um, this catches my eye down here, the fact that it says random below the transposition, okay? Uh, when I turn that on, okay, I'll actually get some variation. Ever hear the variation in my drum there? I'm, I, it, that's all just because I'm randomizing it, okay? Okay, and you can kind of con set that to taste, basically, how much randomization you want on your on your transposition there, okay? Um, so scroll over to here on this side of the instrument, and you'll find you've got some other controls that um, are useful. One is a, a volume control, so if you want a specific sound to be, it's, it's too loud, you want to rein it in a little bit, um, you, can, you can lower the volume. Uh, but there's also a pan control. If you want uh, to add variability to your overall drum loop, okay, one thing you can do is actually pan different elements to different points in the stereo spectrum. Pan some left, pan some right, and kind of create a, the effect of the drums kind of moving between the two speakers, okay? Uh, and again, here's that random word, which I, I, I kind of just gravitate toward the word random whenever I see it in an interface, okay? I can actually randomize the, um, the, the panning information as well. So I uh, probably don't want that on my kick drum, but if I go over to my, um, my snare, okay, um, maybe I want to uh, randomize it a little bit, and, and it's done as a percentage, so it kind of creates a little bit of an effect of it widening the spectrum so it moves a little bit between the speakers. Everybody hear it moving? Okay, which can have a nice effect. Now, probably it'd be good to do it with uh, our, our hi-hat sound here. So with the high rattle, if I increase the random on it, it's now going to dance between the speakers for me. Okay, of course I get to the snare. I hear the moving between the speakers. Okay. So uh, that's a few of my favorite features on this. Um, I don't know. Do you have other questions about this interface? I've kind of skipped over the middle. The middle gives you um, some control over. It gives you a filter for a specific layer within the the impulse instrument. So you can actually dial in a filter if you want to have a low f uh, frequency effect, okay? Low pass filter, high pass filter. These should be uh, familiar abbreviations to you now, yes? After our previous discussion of filters, okay? So you've got a filter you can dial in as well. Um, and heck, that has some randomization as well, which is always fun. Again, I like random, okay? You take one thing away from today. <laughs> okay. Any other questions about impulse and all the controls you have? This is this is by layer. Okay. So then let's look at the simpler instrument. Okay. So I've load. I'm going to go ahead and stop this track from playing. I've got the simpler instrument playing over here. Um, and oh, we didn't pass out keyboards. So let's see if we can power through this uh, by just simply using the uh, piano roll, okay? So if you go ahead and create a clip, okay, so you can play this simpler instrument, okay, and then go to your piano roll, you you should see this little headphones icon again that I mentioned in the browser yesterday. Does anybody remember what that headphones icon does? 
It did, it did a similar thing in the browser. It yeah, it auditions it, right? It allows you to preview the content, right? So if I click on that headphones, I can now play this little keyboard here uh, to play the sound file. If, 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 if. Okay. Uh, and it sounds like it's, it's, so it's, what I have here is actually a little sample of my uh, voice from class last week. Okay. Uh, so right now it's playing just a little bit of the sound file. I want it to actually, let's see, loop the whole thing. Can I get it to play the whole thing? Uh, why is it not playing? Because it was playing the whole thing before. Uh, start and... Two bars. I don't see why it's not playing the whole sound file. Let me scoot out here. Go back to this. Maybe it's just yeah. If, maybe because it's trying to play a little note. If you haven't been gotten started. You need to, if you haven't been gotten started. Okay, so you just need a lot. That, what it is is that live is triggering it with a very short note, which doesn't give it enough time to play the whole sound file. If you haven't been gotten started, you need to get it started at ASAP. Okay. If you haven't been gotten started, you need to get it started So this is me with a warning about your project. Okay. If you haven't been gotten started, you need to get it started at ASAP. Okay. If you so it's going to play through whatever sound file you put in there. It's going to in in um, classic mode, which is where I have it set in the default. Okay, so you see these modes on the the left hand side here. Uh, can I stop? Oh, I can't scoot up any higher. Okay, um, classic is going to play through the sound file for as long as the note is held. Okay, so if you play really short notes and create little short notes in your MIDI uh, clip it's going to play just the beginning of it, okay? Uh, if you instead um, have a longer note, which is what I had to do in the MIDI clip, I had to create a two-bar note in order to get to play the whole sound file, okay? It's going to play through the whole sound file. And this will play short files, long files, basically, but you can play with longer voice samples this way, okay? Um, and start to uh, play parts of them, repeat parts of them, it has a little bit of choppy quality because it actually has some uh, components to be able to um, to be able to control the pitch. Okay, so I played it at C3, which should be about normal pitch. But if I drop it <coughs> to uh, the G2 below that and now play it, if you haven't gotten started, you need to get started ASAP. Okay, if you haven't gotten started. You need to get started ASAP. Somebody coughed in the middle of that. If you haven't gotten started, you need to get started ASAP. That's just in the background. Okay. And it manipulates pitch independent of time. So it's going to try to play it at the same speed that it was before, but play it at the lower pitch. Okay, and you can go up too. Make sense? If you haven't been gotten started, okay. you need to get it started at ASAP. Okay, so that's the classic mode, which I find uh, is, is one application. One shot, um, some of you may be familiar with this one shot terminology from Logic. If you use Logic Sample, what does one shot mean? Have you used Logic Sampler at all? No? Yeah, Daniel. No, uh, well, yeah, it, it's typically used for percussion instruments, but you saw how when I had the short note, it played just the beginning, right? With one shot, as soon as it receives a note on, it's going to play through the entire sample beginning to end, no matter whether you release the note or not, okay? So that's what one shot is. That's the difference between classic and one shot. The next one I want to show you is slice. This is pretty cool here because you'll notice it threw a bunch of little orange 
uh, ticks into the sound file. Okay, these orange ticks represent MIDI notes on your keyboard. Okay, what Live tries to do is find the transients, find the beginnings of sounds, and it's it's made to work with percussion loops, right? It's, it's made to take a percussion loop, chop it up to the constituent beats, and so that you can remix it and recompose with the individual percussion hits within a, a sample, right? Uh, but when you throw it, a voice at it, you get interesting uh, results because it's, it's trying to find the transients in my voice, okay? Uh, and what I can do now is I can actually play different elements of the sound file. Uh, and this, uh, oh, look, I didn't want to do that. Okay. By default, it tries to find them, but you can actually manipulate this. So if you decide that this needs to be nudged over, you just simply grab them and move them, okay? Uh, and if you want to get rid of them, you just double click. Was it double click? Yeah. Double click and it goes away. And now the previous note plays from here to here, basically, okay? So if you find that there's too many ticks that have been inserted, you just simply double click them to remove them. But now if I go back to my piano roll and I've got the preview still enabled, I should be able to, where does this start? I think it's C1. If you haven't gotten starter, each note represents, or each pitch, represents a different slice of the overall sample, okay? So somewhere around here, A A S S A P A P E E S A P E A P E E A P E. So I can kind of play my my letters basically if I wanted to, uh, and let me do that real quick because I just can't resist. A P E A P A P E E A P A P E, e, I don't it. Copy, and then I'm going to paste it here, paste it again. So now, okay. that's just me focusing on two syllables, but you can see how you uh, could take a voice sample, chop it up, and remix it, rework it. Yes. And produce all kinds of fun, of fun effects, yes, with individual words or individual samples, okay? Make sense? Uh, that's a totally different interaction than the impulse, right? Because impulse, you're just simply triggering the sound file, manipulating whether you're, you're the pitch is uh, uh, and and the the panning and the different placement of it, basically. This simpler instrument allows you to then kind of get inside the sound and do um, different operations with parts of the sound, if you will. Okay, uh, and especially this slice feature is pretty fun. Uh, because, as I said, it was designed to work with percussion loops and slice it up by, for the individual drum hits, uh, but there's no reason you can't throw other things at it, like voice, like, I don't know, other music samples, like, try it with field recordings sometimes, right? Okay. Makes sense? Okay. Um, so, are you seeing some possibilities here? Okay. Uh, that's what I wanted to cover in live. Any questions about all of that? before we shift to Max for the remainder of class. Okay, uh, one final thing, if, saving this, right? As soon as you start working with sound files and samples, the uh, collect all and save feature becomes your friend, right? Okay, because, uh, and you, may, you probably experienced this at some point with one of your other DAWs, right? In, importing sound files and bringing them in. Uh, collect all and save will grab all of the samples, anything that you drag from the finder, right? Into It's really easy to drag things from the finder into the impulse instrument, into the simpler instrument, and then save your project and then go to another computer and all of a sudden it can't find the sound files. With the collect all and save button, that's going to allow you to gather all those sound files, save it into your project so that m when you move to another machine, all your sound files are still there, okay? It's going to make your project file bigger, but at the end of the day, it's going to reduce headaches because all your sound files will be in one place. Make sense? So make sure you're using the collect all and save, not just the save feature, okay? Because it's different. Okay, so I'm going to...
Actually, I'm going to do a save as. Is that a question, Christian? Or? Um, how do you add one? That's a good Just question. Double -click. Yeah, double click. You double click to get rid of it and double click to add. Yeah, it's if it's gray because it's showing you that that one's highlighted, and you can click and drag it to move it back and forth. And they're going to be in or the the order of pitches is going to be from left to right. Okay. Um, so the idea is that if you just played a chromatic scale, you could play through the sound file. Uh, but because you can play through a chromatic scale with different timings than you could uh, otherwise, you can kind of jump through different slices. Uh, and, and play with the timing, okay? Uh, okay, I'm leaving live and I'm going over to Max, okay? So uh, there's a, a Max patch that is on Blackboard for today as well, okay? Uh, I've got a number of uh, cheat sheets set up, okay? Uh, in case I have to skip over some things, but I hope I can get through these, okay? Let me get clipping out of the way, and then I need, come on, quit Spotify. Um, I actually need those sound files. So the sound files I had you grab um, Monday in class, I'm going to be using those. Computer music, slides, sounds, there it is. 1003 samples, okay? And uh, this, is worth, this is worth pointing out as well. You may notice that... Um, when you start working with things in live, there's an extra file that gets added next to your sound file. Okay, this is metadata that live is using, uh, that it is creating and saving about your sound file. Okay, so don't delete these extra files if you're using your sound file in live. Okay, live creates this .asd uh, file, and it's again, it's metadata about your sound file so that live can more easily interact with it. Okay. Um, I want to create. I want to actually trigger sound files in Max, okay? And I think I've showed this briefly before. But what you can actually do with these sound files uh, in your Max patch is just simply drag them in, and it creates a little player for you, okay? So I've got the same dull hit that I was using as my my custom kick drum in my uh, in my live session. Uh, I've got it downloaded. I just simply clicked it from the Finder, dragged it into Max, and it creates this little player for me, okay? I've got a play button. I've got a, a loop button so I can have it loop if I want to have the sound file loop. Okay. So try that out. Click and drag one sound file over because if you click and drag multiple sound files, you'll get a different effect. So try it with one at first. Okay. Um, I now want to trigger this kick drum in a regular fashion. I want it to play uh, quarter notes. Okay. So uh, if I'm thinking about creating some, uh, I don't know, some house music and have the kick drum play every quarter note, okay, um, that's where the metro comes in. I've got a, a metro object up here in the corner, which we've covered before. Yes, what does a metro do? What? It's like a metronome, yes, and it produces uh, pulses at a regular beat, right? Okay. Uh, and it, the pulses are, are, are actually special messages in Max called bangs. bangs. Bang is a special message in Max, which basically means do something, okay? Um, uh, and it's going to create that rhythm. Now, you notice, uh, unlike before, I, before I had a, uh, a toggle up here, right? I had a little on-off switch that looked something like this that started the Metro object, okay? Uh, I'm actually not going to use that today. I'm going to use instead a feature that's built into Max, which is the global transport. So if you go to the extra menu, you'll notice there's an option here that says global transport. Okay, That opens a window that looks somewhat like your transport at the top of your DAW, right, in terms of tempo control. Uh, zoom in. Okay. Right? You've got beats. You've got a unit of measurement. You've got a tempo measured in BPM, beats per minute, okay? And you also have a clock here that will count bars, beats, and units, okay? Uh, this is baked into Max, and it gives you a functionality, actually, to create a global 
transport, a global timeline that your max patch can interact with. Okay, um, if I turn this on here with the activate button, you'll notice my metro starts blinking. Okay, because I've actually connected this patch to interact with the global transport. Okay, right now I've got it set to do eight n. Eight n means eighth notes. Okay, so if you do the math, if you do the uh, uh, the kind of mental math on this, the musical mental math on this, 120 BPM, this is playing eighth notes. You can see that's why it's blinking pretty rapidly because it's trying to play. Okay, if I wanted to play quarter notes, I just simply unlock the patch and I can change this from eight n to four n, and I get quarter notes. Okay, so I unlock the patch and I just change that 4n. So before when I was using Metro, I was using I was using milliseconds, right? Okay, and I think I had it at set at like 500 milliseconds, so it was half a second in between pulses. When you use it with the global transport, you want to use this this unit uh, of measurement that it, that Max has divided for referring to different types of beats, different types of pulses within the beat. Okay, 4n for the most common of those are going to be 4n for quarter notes. 8n for eighth notes, 16n for sixteenth notes, 1n for whole notes. Uh, those of you that have had, those of you that are coming out of the music school, these are all kind of fundamental concepts, right, of rhythm. But those of you that have not had uh, four semesters of music theory, okay, uh, these might, hopefully, these names uh, mean something to you. And if not, uh, no quarter notes and no eighth notes, okay, those are useful. If you want to know how to refer to these, uh, and because it, it actually gets kind of complicated when you get into triplets. Uh, this little question mark right here will open up the help file. And there's a link that says time value syntax. If you scroll down here, here's a list of all the time values that you can talk to Max about. Okay. Okay. So if you want to get into different fractions of the beat and make uh, quasi Conlon, uh, Cario, uh, uh, tempos on top of tempos. Here you go, okay? For now, we're going to use quarter notes. We're going to be kind of boring. So I've got this bang button uh, pulsing at the quarter note now. I'm going to leave my global transport up there. I want to play this sound file so that I hear uh, quarter notes. So I'm going to go ahead and connect its output to my speaker, okay? And the sound file player actually, instead of taking bangs, it takes one to start a sound file and zero to stop a sound file. Okay, so if you want to trigger this sound file, we need to actually create a message here with the number one in it that's going to actually trigger this sound file. Okay, and if I turn on the sound, the the patch, and now click this one. Okay, that doesn't sound like a dull hit. Oh, dull hit one. I didn't do my, um, that's not my kick drum. Huge drum is my kick drum. Well, I don't know. It doesn't matter which one. It, the, the ultimate effect is that you can play the sound file, yes? The play button here works as well. And if I turn on looping and hit play, okay, it's going to loop the sound file. But I want it to pulse at a quarter note, right? Okay, so that's where the interaction between my metro and my one comes into play. If I unlock the patch again and I click and connect these things, there's my metronome playing my dull hit one. Okay, in addition, if I go back to the global transport now, I can change the tempo. Or lower the tempo. Okay, so the global transport now is controlling my metro object because I linked it in with the global transport. Is this all making sense to you guys? Any questions at this point? Okay. Okay, so that's kind of bland and boring. Let's do something interesting with it, right? What if I wanted to? I'm going to turn this. Let's see, I'm going to stop the global transport, okay. 
Um, what if I wanted to create a little mini sequencer, right? So that I could play multiple sound files, um, different sound files on different beats, okay? I would need, right now, all of my pulses are equal, right? I don't know the difference between the first one and the last one and the 20th one, right? I want to be able to count them. I want to be able to uh, understand what they're doing, okay? Uh, so I can start to differentiate between 1 and 8 and 16 and those types of things, okay? Um, what I'm going to do now, instead of connecting it directly to my 1, okay, and actually I'm going to go ahead and get a second sound file in here. So I'll go back to my finder and I'll, I'll pull in the huge drum this time. Okay, I can connect it to my output and I also need a message going into it that says 1 so that I can play it. So make sure you get to this point so you can actually play two sound files. There's my huge drum. There's my hit, okay? Okay? So, how to start counting these uh, pulses, okay? There's actually an object called counter, oddly enough, okay? It takes several arguments. The first one tells it whether to count up or down, that's the zero. The next argument, these are all separated by spaces, actually controls the minimum value. The next one controls the maximum value. So I'm going to count between 1 and 8, just for brevity's sake. Okay? So the counter will actually count bangs. So if I connect it to my bang button now, and then, I don't know, I'll throw a number box in here just so I can see what's going on. So you guys believe me that this is actually counting bangs. Now if I turn this on, see my numbers going up and it's going to get to 8 and it's going to go back around. So I've got a nice little counter here that's counting off my, my, my uh, beats within my measure. Okay, Make sense? Okay, so now how do I differentiate between these things? Well, if I, uh, if I use an object called the select object, okay, go ahead and type select and then as arguments, uh, put in the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This is why I didn't use 16 or 32 basically because I have to now type these all in. Okay, so I just did those arguments and it put spaces in between them. When you click off of it, you'll notice that it has the number, it actually has one more outlet than the number of items you put in as arguments, okay? What the select object does is it looks at your input and when it sees a specific number that matches to the arguments in order, it produces a bang out that specific outlet, okay? Um, let me do this real quick just so you can see what this is doing. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that you guys Let's see. You don't have to do this in your patch. I'm going to do this just real quickly. I'm going to add in some bang buttons. Uh, let's see. Do it. And then this is my little trick for creating multiples. Okay. And then if I connect them here, I'm doing this just simply so you can visualize what the select object is doing. Okay. Does that help you see what's going on? So I've taken my beats, I'm now I'm counting them so that they have a number between 1 through 8, and then I'm using the select object to route those numbers into bangs out of specific outlets. Okay? Let me see what's going on there. You don't need the bang buttons in your patch, but if it helps you visualize the progression of the beat, feel free to go ahead and put those in there. Okay? Um, if, I, if you don't have the bang buttons, don't worry about it. You can actually just simply connect two specific beats. So I'm going to go one and five. Three, four, five, two, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, I'm going to connect my... I've now created a rhythm. And I can actually repatch the rhythms to so 
effectively what I'm doing, I'm gonna get these bang buttons out of here just so you can see. I'm patching to create certain rhythmic patterns. Okay? I'm creating a sequenced beat by virtue of the way that I've patched my chords together. Now. Okay? We just did eight, but you could easily do this with 16, with 32, and have it kind of expand so you can patch in different, different rhythms uh, randomly. Okay? Make sense? Okay. This is a way to kind of get at sequenced rhythms inside of Max. Okay. Let me stop my, my rhythm here. Any questions about that? You see the, 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 the trajectory there of how you could create more or less sequenced beats, longer sequenced beats? Okay. Uh, you could also, in this area, actually build some interactivity so that it, uh, you know, 90% of the time it plays the beat on the third pulse, basically. Uh, or 50% of the time it plays it on the se seventh pulse, basically. Because each one of those becomes a decision where you can actually build in some, some uh, interactivity by patching it different ways, okay? Um, okay, so that's triggering pre-made sounds in a kind of rhythmic pat pattern, a la the impulse object, in, or the impulse instrument inside of live, yes? Okay. Uh, how to do things like the simpler, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this. My, my lovely rhythmic pattern that I just created, okay? And if you need that, if you need that again, it's actually right here inside my cheat sheet, so you can kind of see what I did, okay? Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to build a groove looper, something that I can actually uh, pull in a longer sound file and control uh, the, the looping effect on it, okay? So if I create a buffer object, and I'm going to, so, uh, I don't know, uh, buffer is actually an object for holding a sound file in memory, okay? It allows me to load it into RAM, and then I can perform different operations on that sound file, okay? Um, I. For the buffer object, it requires, and you may see this in the list of arguments here, it actually requires that you give it a name. The reason being that once you load it into memory, other objects can then refer back to that piece of memory and do things with the sound. Okay, So we need to give it a name. Uh, I had a very bland name of sample in my cheat sheet. It give a, a better name for what do we want to call this sound that we're going to load. Let's call it Matthew after the hurricane that's coming, okay? Cool, okay? So I've named this buffer Matthew, okay? Uh, this is now a chunk of memory where I can load a sound file. And I can actually, I'm gonna go to the, my get started sound sample. I can actually drag and drop onto the buffer and have it load the sound file into it. Now, I didn't get any visual feedback that it got loaded, but if you lock your patch and double click on the buffer, you see a little visual representation of the waveform, okay? Just letting you know that it it got loaded into memory, okay? So this is a little floating window that you can double click and get to. Um, that's kind of cool. I'd prefer to have it actually in my patch. So go ahead and create a new object. Type in the word waveform tilde. But before you hit enter, wait with the blinking cursor there, okay? and say at, where'd it go, at name? No, is it not gonna let me do that? Oh, no, I just have to give it a name. No, oh, it's not gonna let me do it. Let me try again here. Waveform, I did this last night, let's see. Name. <coughs> That should do it. Let's see. No. What's the attribute called? Buffer object name. Yeah, it's not letting me access that for some reason. Um, okay, so here's how we we want to connect this waveform. So if you've got the waveform and it looks blank, okay, we want to connect it with this little chunk of memory here inside the buffer, okay? So Highlight it and go over to the inspector. So you click on the eye. Scroll down, you should see something that says, uh, where is it? Buffer object name. There it is right there. Okay. 
So buffer object name, type in Matthew, and this has to match exactly. When I hit return, you should now see a representation of the, the buffer, right? Okay. Uh, now, I can do a couple things with this. Uh, so back to in my, my eye, uh, my inspector, right? Uh, under click mode, go ahead and change that to loop. Because what I can now do when I lock the patch, I can actually select part of the sound file to loop over and over again. Okay. Uh, and this is where I'm going to use, I'm going to pull a cooking show uh, manipulation here. I'm going to open up my, because we're out, I see that we're out of time. If I drag over my cheat sheet, I'm going to connect this. I'm going to highlight it, and I'm going to hit Edit, De-Encapsulate, okay? So feel free to start packing up if you've got to go to class, but I just want to show you this. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I want to show this real quick. I'll maybe, if we have class on Friday, I'll, I'll maybe spend a little bit more time here, okay? I can play it. If you haven't got... I can actually interactively scrub and loop through the parts of the sound file. Started. You see some possibilities there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. For creating new sounds. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't think I have anything else on my slides other than to tell you to watch your email for uh, about class on Friday. Um, make sure you uh, notify me if you're doing a cover song. Okay. I uh, will see you guys. Maybe Friday. Maybe Monday. We'll see. Started a s a b s a get get me to 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 get you need you need you need you need to get 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 get